Good morning and welcome to the Transit Museum. My name is Elise Newman and I'm the education manager here and I'm so excited to welcome everybody to a really special day here at the Transit Museum, our Access for All Symposium. We're really thrilled that you chose to join us here for a day of conversation around how to create positive strengths-based programs for people with autism. We have a really wide range of people in the audience. We have people from art museums, science museums, zoos. We have parents, community leaders, and advocates. And I hope that throughout the day, during our breaks, and at the end of the day, at our reception, you have a chance to chat with one another, share your experiences. We have a number of people from out of town as well. Um, so thank you so much for those of you who traveled to get here. After the conversations uh, that you will hear and participate in today, our hope is that you will leave this museum armed with information about the types of experiences, both large and small, that you or your institution can provide for people of all ages on the autism spectrum. And I hope you'll leave with a sense of urgency. Autism is a, is a condition prevalent in one in 68 children, including one in 42 boys. Each one of us, whether we know it or not, through our personal life or in our community life or in our work, have interacted with someone on the autism spectrum. As parents and advocates in the audience will tell you, people on the spectrum of all ages need access to the same informal learning opportunities as neurotypical people. But many existing programs like after school arts programs, sports teams, summer camps, and job opportunities don't meet the specialized needs of people with autism. This lack of opportunity can lead to a sense of isolation and even despair. This is where we come in. And why a day like today is so important as the first step for many of you or as a continuation of the incredible work that you've already done to create experiences for people on the spectrum. I'd like to open the day by introducing our museum director, Conchetta Bensavanga, who joined the museum in January of this year. When Conchetta talks about her previous leadership experiences at the Please Touch Museum in Philadelphia, the Ideal School of Manhattan, the Peace Corps, and other nonprofits, a common thread quickly becomes apparent. Throughout her career, she has been devoted to formal and informal learning experiences for people of all abilities, as well as community engagement. Please join me in welcoming Conchetta. everyone. We are so excited. It's going to be a great day. Um, good morning and welcome to the New York Transit Museum. As Elise said, my name is Conchetta Bensavanga and I am the brand new director of this incredible institution. I feel so lucky that I get to welcome you to our very first Access for All Symposium, generously supported by the Marengoff Foundation, and to help launch a dialogue on how we, how we can, as an arts and culture sector, endeavor together to make our institutions and our community more accessible to everyone, and specifically to people with autism. While this might be our first symposium, the truth of the matter is that members of the ASD community, that's to say folks with autism, have very likely been part of the Transit Museum story since, well, since there's been a Transit Museum. Allow me, if you will, to take you back in time to late 1975-76. Gerald Ford is president, and he has famously told the broke New York City to drop dead. We actually have that in, uh, in one of our exhibitions right now, according to the famous headline. The city and its systems are literally and figuratively teetering on the brink when a group of transit employees got together and they stated an empirical fact and then set out to redress the situation. And those were the following. Creating, building, and maintaining the New York City subway system is one of the greatest engineering feats in US history. And up until that point in time, no one had told our story. And the group knew about an abandoned subway station across the street used for storage. That's this place. <laughs> they decided to hold an exhibition from July 4th, 1976 through Labor Day, 1976, in honor of the, the country's bicentennial, and to share with anyone who was interested how the New York City subway came to be. And 40 years later, we're still here. We never closed our doors. So what exactly is it about subways, and as it turns out, buses, trains, bridges, and tunnels, 
that has been a draw to people with autism? Well, consider this from Temple Grandin. What I've tried to do is combine both my personal experiences with scientific research. I like to cross the divide between the personal world and the scientific world. What better example do you need of something or some things that affect your personal world and relies on the scientific world to do so? The MTA's transportation system, with 11 million trips per day, that's not people, that's trips, passengers per day, which is also, by the way, the size of Greece or Bolivia, that's how many people trips there are through the system on a daily basis, provides an orderly, systematized, engineered way to navigate, quite literally, your life. Of course it's a draw for everyone, and even more so for folks on the autism spectrum. And this institution, charged with preserving and inter interpreting that system, has just been a natural fit for a group of people who are oftentimes our most passionate, our most enthusiastic, and as the new girl, I can attest, regularly the most knowledgeable um, constituents that we have for 40 years. One of the biggest differences between then and now is likely merely the difference between diagnosed and undiagnosed people. But in a very real sense, a diagnosis, while not immaterial, isn't really a huge variable for us because, as the saying goes, when you meet one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. The biggest variable is that folks with autism have just always been a part of our family. And interestingly, my colleague and I were at an event with Autism Speaks last week, and I have to tell you the reaction between folks who perhaps were not, uh, did, were not lucky enough to have ASD folks in their life, uh, when we said we were from the Transit Museum, they'd say, oh, that's, that's interesting. Why is the Transit Museum at this mansion on the Upper East Side? And we were like, we don't know either, but we're really happy to be here. And then when we met folks who were experienced, uh, who had members of their life that were um, identified as uh, ASD, they'd be like, oh my God, we love that place. We're there all the time. It's amazing. Thank you so much. You've saved our life. And, and we're like, oh, well, we love you too, you know? And so um, if you've ever met a train but who happens to be on the spectrum, you know that this will, this will be the case, this relationship will be the case for a good long while. And, th and for that, we feel incredibly grateful and like I said, nothing like a train buff to keep you on your toes, and incredibly well positioned to create the space for this conversation today. Now, it's tempting to think, well, that's great for the Transit Museum, but you just laid out that your history and your collection is highly correlated to the interests of people on the spectrum, and that's not the case in my institution, and I'm not even sure we have many ASD visitors. Um, uh, yes, yes, you do. Uh, I promise that you do. It's a big neurodiverse world out there, and every single day, neurodiverse learners are coming to visit. They just are. But if they aren't, it might be because we, as a sector, aren't making it easy for them. And that's the next thing I want to emphasize. It is entirely likely that this day and this conversation has less to do with people who have autism and more to do with the people who don't. And here again, I'll let Temple Grandin say it better than I could. Normal people have an incredible lack of empathy. They have good emotional empathy, but they don't have much empathy for the autistic kid who's screaming at the baseball game because he can't stand the sensory overload, or the autistic kid having a meltdown in the school cafeteria because there's too much stimulation. So this workshop is a chance for us as practitioners, as stewards of that space where learning and community meet, and Elise was totally right, that is my favorite spot on the planet, uh, to challenge ourselves, to challenge one another, to think creatively about the emotional empathy we all bring to our institutions, about our level of preparedness to make all of our, vis our visitors feel truly welcome, and to be at home in arts and culture. I want to wrap it up with a quick story, but before I do, I would be completely remiss if I didn't thank four groups of people. So not four people, four groups of people. First, to my incredible staff who are so committed to this work, specifically Elise Newman, who you just met, and Meredith Gregory, who many of you know, but many of you we will meet with throughout the day. Um, they are the quarterbacks and the people leading the charge, and I am honored to call them my colleagues. Um, and also, by the way, this work is passionately and inspiringly carried out by our educators, our frontline staff, our back of house folks. It's a whole institution endeavor. Next to our panelists, people have joined us today to share their knowledge, their stories, and their perspectives. Thank you for being here. 
We are honored to learn from you and to learn with you. Third, to our participants, that's you guys. I'm told we have people in attendance from Utah, from St. Louis, from Singapore, Boston, and Philadelphia. Thank you for coming all this way, and thank you for the locals for joining us too. We honestly hope that today is a spark that becomes a movement, and that, as, it, as has happened so many times before, arts and culture can lead the way in illuminating new and better ways to make what we do more available to all. And finally, we will forever be indebted to the people with autism who love us, who challenge us, who frankly keep us on our toes for providing, to borrow a phrase from Tony Atwood, a bright thread in the rich tapestry of the New York Transit Museum. Okay, so now the story. A few weeks back, we had one of our special day for special uh, friends events. I think lots of folks probably do this. You open a little early, you keep the ambient noise down, uh, try and uh, create some quiet spaces. It's an amazing event. Um, we had some media coverage. A, a journalist showed up and wanted to cover the day. It ended up being a fantastic piece. Um, so the reporter is on the platform downstairs where we have our vintage collection, and she wanted to interview a child and a family about what the day meant to them. So the reporter, uh, we grab a, a guy, his mom and his uncle, and we're chatting, and we decide they'd be great for the piece. Um, the uncle goes first, and Meredith and I kind of absent ourselves to let the, the interview happen. And shortly thereafter, the reporter comes over and says, um, we have, a, we have a problem, and we're like, well, what's the problem? And the uncle is saying there isn't anything wrong with the nephew, that the nephew is perfectly typical. And so we're like, oh, that's interesting, okay, great. And I think that's one of the big takeaways for today, is that if it's not obvious, doesn't mean it doesn't exist, doesn't mean it's something that shouldn't be included in the way that we interpret our institutions. So we grab the mom, and as can, thank God Meredith was there because no one would believe this if I told the story. Turns out the mom is a special education teacher from Queens, okay? And so she, this is her field, this is what she does, and she looks at us and she says, no, he's totally on the spectrum. My son is on the spectrum. I don't know what my brother's talking about, he's on the spectrum. So we go, okay, fine, great, we continue with the piece, and this kid knocks it out of the park. He has a great day. Then they go to the mom and they say, what does today mean to you? And this is what she said. She said basically the biggest takeaway for her coming to this event was that she could relax. That if her kid was having a bad day, she was very sure that every other person in the museum was probably had their child have a bad day someplace in public too. And not having to worry, not walking on eggshells, not feeling judged is really what made that such a special occasion for her and that they could do it as an entire family. There's no segmentation, you don't have to take one and worry about the other, they all could come. They all felt welcome. And that, right there, that's why today matters. That is the line on the horizon. To create spaces where people can bring their whole selves to our institutions, to be enriched by what we have to offer, and by their presence and participation, to, en to enrich the definition and application of what it means to be a truly inclusive community. Thank you so much, and have a fantastic day. introduce our keynote speaker for the day, Amy Gravino. Amy Gravino is a certified autism specialist and the president of ASCOT Coaching, ASCOT Coaching. Amy offers college coaching for services for students on the autism spectrum and autism consulting for individuals and families. Amy has established herself as a professional speaker and has presented to numerous audiences on a variety of topics, including girls and ASD, growing up on the spectrum, bullying, ASD and transition, and her specialty, autism and sexuality. Among Amy's professional highlights are speaking on a panel at the United Nations on World Autism Awareness Day and giving her first TEDx talk at Seton Hall University. Please join me in welcoming Amy. Well, thank you, Elise, for that wonderful introduction. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, isn't this place cool? Yeah. <laughs> I've never been here before. This is really cool. Uh, kind of a hidden treasure of, of New York, I would say. So thank you all for having me here today. Um, so my presentation, I'm calling Staying Clear of the Closing Doors. 
we've all heard that one before, we know that. Um, traveling through life with autism. In this case, the doors are literal and figurative, and we'll go into that in the, in the presentation a little bit. Um, so thank you, Elise, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you to Meredith and Elise for inviting me to speak here today. I truly appreciate it. So several years ago, I received an email from a woman who is a reader of my blog. And I'll have a link to that blog at the end, by the way, so you can write it down. Um, and she had, was the, the mother of a nine-year-old girl who had just been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. And she said they didn't know any older girls or women on the spectrum. And she made a suggestion that I write a letter to my younger self as a way of giving advice to her daughter and to all the other girls and women on the spectrum and their families, all people on the spectrum and their families. And so in order to bring you into my world, and specifically my world circa when I was about nine or 10 years old, I'm going to read this to you. So dear Amy, I know you're feeling pretty bad right now. The other kids make fun of you a lot and you don't know why. You're trying really hard to be friends with them, doing all of the things you think they want you to do. And it's just not working. But there is one thing you should know. It's not your fault. Other people might say that, and you won't be able to listen to them, but I am hoping that you will if it's coming from me. It's not your fault. Say it over and over in your head when you feel the worst, because that's when you'll need it most. It's not your fault. How can it not be your fault? You'll say to yourself as the next few years go by, everyone else can do this, can make friends and be normal. Why can't you? That's just one of the many questions I know you have, questions you don't know how or are afraid to ask. They make you feel overwhelmed, like sitting in Mrs. St. Pierre's classroom every day, fidgeting nervously in your seat. You always get up during class to sharpen your pencil, and I know it's because you enjoy the smell when they're freshly sharpened. It calms you down. So don't feel bad if the other kids snicker or laugh when you, sharp, when you smell your pencil. They don't understand. You care a lot about what the other kids think of you. I know you hate going to pool every week because you have to change in the locker room and the girls make fun of your feet. This will cause you not to feel comfortable wearing flip-flops for many years, and you won't be okay with wearing them again until you're much older. It'll be like that with a lot of things people say to you. Their exact words will fade from memory. The effects they have on you will last a very long time. But don't worry. One day, you're going to meet someone and make friends with them and someone who loves your feet and will call your little toe, one that didn't grow in right, your lucky toe. That's something you feel like you could use a lot of right now, luck. You keep hoping things will get better, but they never do. I have some good news, though. You won't lose that hope. No matter what happens, you'll still be optimistic. Foolishly, maybe, but when you're older, people will tell you how wonderful it is that you are that way. But I have to be honest with you. Things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. You'll be in junior high school soon, and you don't know it, but seventh and eighth grades will be two of the worst years of your life. Once again, it's not your fault. You like to look at things outside the window. The trees and blue sky make you feel calm. One day you'll be in study hall and you'll go right up to the window and stick your head out of it. That's when someone will tell you to jump. Other voices will join in. And even after the teacher finally tells everyone to be quiet and calms things down, you'll hear them in your head for a long time to come. Every day, someone will make you feel less not human, unwanted, and you'll keep your head down and take it because no one's going to tell you anything different. But I will. You're not less, Amy, you're more. More because you have to work twice as hard as everyone else to make your voice heard. You don't know how to fight right now, except for when you lash out after not being able to handle the pain anymore, and then it's you who gets into trouble rather than your tormentors. They know how not to be seen, to avoid detection. You don't. Even as an adult, you won't quite fully master the art of subtlety, but right now you're bared to the world, completely vulnerable, and your classmates are taking full advantage of that fact. They know how to hurt you in the worst ways, so they can get their kicks from your reactions. You can't understand what they're doing, and you just play straight into their hands every time. Once again, it's not your fault. These days, your classmates call you names. Ugly, freak, psycho, loser, retard, they call you these things because they don't know you, don't care to, and don't want to. You're trying so hard to force yourself into their world with little to no success. But you will have friends one day, Amy. Better still, 
You won't have to fight for their friendship. They will come to you. I know how unbelievable that seems, especially since you feel like no one wants to be around you at all, not even your parents. But you are loved, even if you don't realize it. You just have to learn how to love yourself. There are some things that you're good at, Amy, like writing. You just started writing some poems and were happy when you saw them published in the local paper. Your mom and dad sent them in for you, just in case you were wondering how that happened. <laughs> I have three words of advice for you. Keep doing it. Right now, you write because it's an escape from the world around you, and you don't care about being good at it. But one day, you won't just be writing for yourself. You'll be writing to help other people. And your writing will help people, even when you don't realize it. So you've got to keep at it. It's hard to think that you're good at anything when people are constantly telling you that everything you do and are is wrong. In middle and high school, your classmates will tell you to your face to kill yourself and that no one wants you around or would care if you were gone. Don't listen to them. I know it's difficult and their words will go right into you, but they are not worth it. You are a good person, a person worth having around, and you'd make so many people sad if you were gone. The world is going to need you when you grow up, Amy, so you have to get there. You have to make it through these dark days because you're going to make a difference in the future. Someday, people will want to hear what you have to say, and you won't believe it at first. You're going to have to take a lot of crap and go through a lot of pain to get there, but I promise you it will be worth it. My time with you is now growing short, young Amy. I hope that some of the things I've said have brought you comfort, or at least given you assurance that there is indeed light at the end of this tunnel. In short, things will get better. A lot of people will say that to you, and you'll think that they're just trying to make you feel better. But it's really honestly true. You're an incredibly special, talented girl, and right now you're toiling in obscurity, as so many great artists do. But someday the world is going to see how amazing you are, and all you'll think is, where were you people when I was younger? The future seems far away, almost impossible to think about. But don't be afraid to think about it. You're not even sure if you're going to have a future, but you will. You will. And I'll say to you now three words that you don't hear very often, even when your mother says them to you. Three words that you'll be desperate to hear when you get older, especially from a good-looking member of the opposite sex, but that seem very off in the distance right now. I love you. I love you, my younger, high-strung, uniquely wonderful self. And I'll be here waiting for you. See you in 15 years. Love and many hugs, your 26-year-old self. So, we all like the cute pictures. There's me on the first day of school. Don't let your eyes deceive you. That's not actually an 80-year-old librarian. That's, that's a little girl. Um, though the fashion would have you believe otherwise. Um, who let me dress myself? I don't know. Anyway, so I was diagnosed uh, as having Asperger's syndrome when it was still an actual thing in the DSM uh, in 1994 when I was 11 years old. Um, it was kind of a miracle that I even was diagnosed given how there was just so, so much less awareness of, of autism at the time, and especially being a girl, that um, you know, this child psychologist at Stony Brook University on Long Island was keen enough to recognize it. And so that was, you know, that was when we started off on the path that we're still walking on, I guess, to this day. Um, and I can only say really what it was like from my perspective. My parents who are here today can tell you what it was like for them. Um, but for me, the word autism didn't mean anything at that age. Um, I, I only knew that I was different, and I didn't know exactly why, but I knew that it was bad because that was what the reaction was from my classmates. Um, so, but the, 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 the mentality shifted because prior to the diagnosis, it was, well, why, don't, why doesn't everybody see things the way that I do? What's wrong with them? And then after the diagnosis, which happened to coincide with the beginnings of you know, puberty and pre-adolescence, it became, why can't I see things the way everybody else does? What's wrong with me? <laughs> um, and a lot of that, of course, has to do with the pressures that come along with entering junior high. It even starts earlier, I swear. Every year it starts earlier. It starts in sixth grade, maybe even fifth grade, to fit in and to be like everybody else and to not want to stand out. Um, but I was physically incapable of not standing out. Um, I had, you know, big teeth, as you can see, and I had these big, thick glasses, and I was just very awkward. I just, I was not very coordinated. You know, a lot of folks on the spectrum have fine motor coordination issues, gross motor coordination. I had all that. So I, I just was uh, easy pickings, really. And the, the bullying started, you know, in about third grade, I would say. Um, the girl who I refer to as my nemesis 
started picking on me then, and then it went all the way to graduation. So it pretty much didn't let up. Um, I, I remember an incident in sixth grade in, in home ec class. We were, had to do sewing. This might be why I don't like to sew to this day, but my hair was very long, and it got caught in the needle in the machine, and I was screaming, you know, and the kids are laughing, and nobody's doing anything. I don't even remember the teacher stepping in until maybe a few minutes after. It, it felt like it went on forever. You know, when something like that happens, it feels much longer probably than it really was. But that kind of began a pattern, which was that um, teachers, you know, I don't think knew what to make of me. I was probably the first or second kid to go through my district who was autistic. And they, there was not any support in place. Um, there were no self-contained classrooms that didn't exist. Um, I was mainstreamed all through school. And the, the only... Um, kind of special class that I was ever in was resource room in seventh grade. Uh, but again, that was for kids who had academic difficulties. And the only time I had academic difficulties was when my social problems got so bad that it affected my academics. Because who wants to do the school? Who, you know, I couldn't see the point. Why am I bothering to do all this? Because I, I don't want to be in this building. I'm miserable. What is the point? Um, and a lot of people didn't make that connection, I think, between the two at the time. So that this is when the problems kind of really began um, and again, you know, I, I'm not fully blaming teachers. I know we probably have some teachers here today, and I know teachers have a thankless job. Um, but I remember the, the ones who tried. This is what I, what I always say is give a crap. Don't be afraid to give a crap. Even if you messed up, even if you try something, maybe it doesn't work so great, at least you tried. The kid 20 years later is going to remember that you tried. And they'll also remember if you didn't do anything. And that's what I remember. So. I had one very lovely guidance counselor who really tried to help me, but she was really the only one, I, I would say, of, of all the teachers that I had. At the, I mean, they were not not all bad, don't get me wrong, but they just didn't know. And, and, but then when we get to middle school, it, it was more, you know, of the same. Oh, it's kids being kids. No, it's not kids being kids. You can never excuse bullying as that because there's a dynamic at work that you as the adult, as the teacher, don't see. It's... um. It reminds me, I don't know if anybody here is a fan of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the TV show, but there was an episode where there's a demon that only the little kids can see because they're sick with this fever. The, the adults can't see it. That's what bullying is like in junior high school. In elementary school, it's more overt. You know, hair pulling or, or teasing, you know, kid, kids are more obvious. But when they hit middle school, it becomes much more subversive. And especially when it's girls bullying, it's, it's on, typically it's on an emotional level. It's not really the physical stuff. I mean, occasionally, unfortunately, you, we may have some violent incidents, but it becomes much more subtle. And so you could, for example, you could see one of your kids who's on the spectrum talking to a group of peers in the hall. It looks like a perfectly normal thing. But what's really going on there? What, what are the peers trying to goad or trying to coax the autistic student into doing that they don't know is not a good thing to do? Um, this was my experience. And so what ended up happening, you know, I, I went to a very small school. I had 88 kids in my graduating class, so we all knew each other pretty much from kindergarten. Um, and once you're labeled as something, that's what you were, right to graduation. And so what would happen is, you know, they would tease me and tease me and goad me and goad me. And when I finally couldn't take it anymore, I would have a meltdown. I would react, I would snap, and then I was the one who would get in trouble, as I said in the letter. And that was what the teachers would see. They didn't see everything leading up to it. They just saw me acting inappropriately. So I got the in-school suspensions. I got the out-of-school, you know what I mean? I got detention. I was the one <laughs> getting in trouble, um, which if you wonder why kids might end up hating school, there, there's, a, there's a kind of an IRA, you know. But what ends up happening a lot is, is kind of teachers sympathize more with the bullies, I think, than, than the bullied. It seems to be, it's, it's not anything anyone does on purpose. It's just sort of, a natural outgrowth, but so nobody seemed to believe me when I would say, you know, no, this just, and they were like, no, 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 you, every, it was fine, I was watching, and then you, you started acting out. <laughs> I have to laugh, I'm laughing right now, because if I don't, I'll be crying, <laughs> because these things stay with you, you know, these are the formative years, and if you have this kind of foundation, all, you know, you dig, I can, I'm older now, I can look back, and I can laugh, and I can see it for what it was, but it breaks my heart because I know it's still going on. <laughs> I know there are autistic kids in school who are still being bullied and still not being believed. And, and that's what I'm fighting against with every fiber of my being because I don't want anyone to go through what I went through. That's why I do what I do. But um, 
you know, middle school was definitely when things got really, really hard um, in school and at home as well. There were, there were challenges, you know, my dad, we're 99% sure, is on the spectrum as well, though he's not been officially diagnosed. And we butted heads quite a bit at, you know, this is the age, you're 12, 13, 14, you're challenging authority, or, and I mean, of course, every little thing feels like the end of the world. And so I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't get a break. I would come home and my parents, who are both retired teachers, by the way, who would not let me miss school if I was bleeding out of my eyes. Um, you know, everything was, did you do your homework? Did you do, like, I just wanted to relax. I needed to decompress after all the, after just trying to hold it together each day. That's what every day of school was like. It was just holding myself together as much as I could. There was someone who recently referred to it as the five o'clock meltdown, which happens to, especially I think girls on the spectrum where we hold it together for the whole day, get home and then just everything just comes out. Um, so that was what I was experiencing. But then I was, you know, having some difficulties and then my poor mother was ended, ended up playing the referee between me and my dad. Um, and I'm an only child, so you know, it was just me. And so it was, it was hard. It was definitely hard. I felt like I just didn't have a place. I felt like my family didn't really want me or care about me. I felt like people at school didn't want me or care about me. I know differently, by the way, now in terms of my family. I mean, I can look back. I'm not 14 years old anymore, I can see. But at the time, that's what it felt like. I think that's what leads a lot of people to despondency. A lot of autistic individuals who end up um, taking their lives by a suicide is because of that despair, that feeling. You, we, and it's not just the autism, it's being 14, 15 years old and, and feeling like life is always going to be this way. It's never going to get better. So when you don't have this, a support, when you don't have anything to tell you otherwise, it's very hard to move out of that mindset. And I was suicidal for many years. Although just through practicality, I couldn't actually do it. I couldn't swallow pills and I was afraid of knives and blood. So, like, I just, I mean, it wasn't going to, you know, but, so just on a practical level, it wasn't going to happen. But now, you know, I have almost a little bit of survivor's guilt because I know there are so many folks who didn't make it through. And I ask myself, why me? Why did I get through it? Well, maybe I got through it because I got to be here today in front of all of you telling you about this and being a voice for them because they're, they're not here to speak for themselves. So that's how I kind of try to assuage my guilt there. But, um, so then high school, you know, this is when it kind of, all just, it felt like this is going to be life forever. It's never going to get better. Um, in high school, it became kind of a running contest between I was either bullied or I was ignored. And it was hard to know which was worse or better sometimes. Um, and, and as a result, you know, I, I, I began to um, suffer with depression. I, I, was, I went on Prozac at the age of 12, um, liquid Prozac, and voluntarily went off it at 15. But um, it's, it's very isolating. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't meet a fellow person on the spectrum actually until, or like someone, a girl, like my age, until I was maybe about 15, and she didn't go to my school. So I really felt like I was the only one who was going through what I was going through. And it was just incredibly lonely. Um, it, was, it was very, very hard. And, you know, obviously you, when you get older, you see, because you, you think everybody when you're in high school has all their stuff together, and, that they're, and everybody knows what they're doing except you. And then you find out when you're older, oh no, everybody else is a mess too. Why didn't they tell me that? You know, we could have suffered together, but no, you all look so perfect and happy and attractive. And you know, um, side note though, people who peak in high school, I'm glad I wasn't one of them. I think, I think I came into my own quite nicely. Um, I'm 34 and people still tell me I look 21. I don't know. Anyway, so um, so yeah, it was it was a very very difficult time, and and you know the other form of isolation that I wasn't aware of really at the time, but that I am now is the isolation my parents suffered because because I didn't have you know friends with in my class like my other peers did, and I wasn't socializing. My parents didn't have the opportunity to you know be friends with the other kids' parents, so they were kind of isolated too. And my our our whole family is in New Jersey. You know, my parents are originally from New Jersey, so we were geographically isolated as well. There wasn't that support network that people have when they have relatives and family living close by. So it was, I think it was hard on all of us to, to not feel like we had anybody who we could really lean on for, for that support. Um, and, and in thinking about the future, again, I, I knew I was going to go to college because, again, daughter of two teachers, you have to go to college. That was a definite, but after that, I didn't have a clue. I didn't even know what, what I could possibly do with my life or if I could have a life. It was, it was something that I thought to myself, this isn't something that people like me have. 
like when I would watch Disney movies and think, well, this isn't what, girls like me don't get these happily ever afters. Girls like me don't get the prince. Um, I, I believed because of the bullying and because of my very low self-esteem that I was not entitled to the same things as, as my neurotypical peers, um, which is not a happy place to be mentally. But um, so in 2006, I moved to Seattle, Washington. This was after I graduated college, 3,000 miles across the country, um, away from everybody, my friends, family, but there was a boy, which is always the worst possible reason to move 3,000 miles across the country. <laughs> um, and in, in moving, I had to, for the first time, really know how to, to get around because you know, I didn't have parents driving me everywhere. And in college, the only public transportation I took was I would take the bus from Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania into Port of Authority. The only subway I knew how to take was the one from Port Authority to Penn Station and then take the train out to Long Island. That was it. But in Seattle, they had a bus system. And these were the paper transfers. This is 10 years ago. I don't even know if they still use these. This is, this is what they would give you um, so that you didn't have to like pay for the second, you know what I mean, if you're transferring to another bus type thing. And this was the first tangible proof I had that I was doing it myself. I was making my way. Um, and we kept these. My mother, we still had these in my desk. I don't know how or why, but, um, and, you know, I look at them and, you know, the whole idea of transferring, that's kind of what I'm getting at here is, is moving from that place of childhood, from that place of adolescence where you're relatively protected um, and cared for to adulthood, which is, like the Wild West, where you're on your own, you have to make your own way, and how hard it is for people on the spectrum when we age out of the systems and when we have to go into the community. Um, so, and that's me waiting for a bus in Seattle. That's me at a bus stop. Um, and, and being an adult, you know, oh, thank you. Thank you for the high sign. Um, I'll, I'll speed up. So, <laughs> it's, uh, th there really is not very much out there for adults. There's, there's, very little in the way of supports and services. And it, it, it can be challenging to feel welcome in the community because even if a place has the best programs on earth, it means nothing if we can't actually physically get there. And that piece often ends up missing. And I think about that being in this wonderful museum and thinking about accessibility. Accessibility means so many different things, but it means that something has to be able to be accessed by all people. Um, otherwise, it's no good in my view. And so, how do we welcome autistic individuals into the community? How do we make sure that accessibility is something that's possible? Um, it's, it's very hard you know, to have to go into the world, to suddenly have to be a self-advocate and speak for yourself when everybody your whole life has always told you, well, this is the support you need, and this is how you learn, and this is... And when you go to college, and then when you're in the real world especially, you have to do it yourself. So it is so important to encourage you know, independence and to encourage folks on the spectrum to use their voices from an early age. It doesn't, it can't start when we, when we finish school. It has to start way before then. Um, and then when we, you know, when we think about the community and we think about opening organizations and opening programs to people on the spectrum, we have to consider that each person's needs are different because it is such a wide spectrum. And so you can't use a one size fits all approach necessarily. Um, and that can be hard, I know, for a lot of organizations, especially with budgetary concerns. But this is what, this was the opening picture in my, of my PowerPoint. And I found this, and to me, this is a perfect visual of what a lot of people on the spectrum encounter when we try to go in the community. There are a lot of barriers, both visible and invisible, and, and that we can't get past one, one way or another. Um, and, it, and those barriers, a lot of people may not again, sense that they exist, but that's what keeps a lot of people from accessing programs and going out into the communities, feeling like, I don't know if I can do this, I'm so anxious, will I be accepted here? Will this be the right thing for me? Um, and so this is, you know, what we face every day in, in different forms. Um, so to parents, I say to you, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more on the, on the panel later, you're, you are your child's best advocate but encourage them to use their voice and speak for themselves as well. Um, be a safe space and open a dialogue with your child. You, know, you want them to be able to come to you when they're struggling with things, whatever it is they want to talk about, be it school, be it crushes, be it friends. 
you let them know that you're there and you're going to listen to them in a non judgmental way and that is going to pay off in dividends for years to come, believe me. Um, and as I said, encourage independence, but remember as well that everybody goes at their own pace. So not everybody can be independent in the same way as everyone else, you know what I mean? So it varies for each person. Th that journey is gonna be different for each person. If someone needs supports, that's okay too, you know, because that's gonna help them on their way. You don't have to pull out the rug right away either. It's, you wanna have a balance. Um, and to professionals, always remember you're dealing with a person, not just a diagnosis and a set of symptoms. Um, you, you, you can't necessarily design something without you know, considering the, the human people who are gonna be partaking in it. Um, consider all the elements, you know, not, not just the actual material that's in the program, but what's the space where the program is gonna be held? What's the lighting like? What's the sound? Is it accessible by, by, by the, the transit? All these things have to come into play when we're thinking about creating programs for people on the spectrum. And above all, put ego aside. And this seems like it should be a given, but I encounter a lot of people who, they become personally offended. If, oh, I designed this great glorious program and these people don't like it, how dare they not bow down to me? Well, no, we <laughs> go back to the drawing board, chief, I'm sorry. You know what I mean? It's, this is not about you. This is not about how fabulous or not fabulous you are. This is about you know, doing the best we can to support individuals on the spectrum to enable them to be in the community and succeed. So put that aside, don't take things personally because it's not some personal affront to you if, if there's a problem with your program. Um, so that's me at three years old. And I think about the world that this girl was gonna grow up in, what was coming, you know, she had no idea. Obviously she's sitting on a pumpkin, she's happy as a clam. <laughs> Mixed metaphor, maybe, I don't know. But, um, and I, I, I think about all the little, little kids now who are gonna grow up in a, hopefully a different world than the one I grew up in. And that I think will only be possible if we listen to autistic individuals, if we take their viewpoints into account when designing programming. And hopefully the kids now, people now will not have to go through what I went through, and because you're here, I know you're on the, on the right path to doing that. So, thank you, this is my contact information here. I'll let you, if you wanna write anything down. I also have business cards if anybody wants any. Um, and thank you for your attention, and we'll go to Q&A. Don't be shy, I'll answer anything you want to ask. I, I don't mind. Um, oh, hello. So, um, I'm from the Museum of Science in Boston. Uh, my name's Erica. I um, was wondering, you said you met the first girl that was your friend or was like you at 15. How did you meet that person? Oh, how did, how did I meet May? Do you remember? Oh, so yes, there's, so there's an organization called AHANY on Long Island. Uh, this girl's mother, I, I guess, was part of it. She came, she came to the groups. The, my mother jo has been on the board of AHA for many, many years, and she started going to the support group meetings. And that's where she met this girl's mother. And so the mom introduced us, and I think the first time we ever hung out, we dug for buried treasure in my backyard. Because I, I was convinced there was treasure. So that, that was how we met. Anybody else? Wait for the microphone. Hi, um, I just have a question about um, labeling and sharing labels with uh, kids who are diagnosed. When, how, and if, mm. because that is, as a parent, it's been a constant discussion that I've had with other parents mm. about, you know, is it helpful, is it not helpful? It is helpful. It is never a good thing to, to keep the diagnosis from someone, because I think of all the adults that I know who were not diagnosed until they were in their 30s, 40s, 50s, they went through their whole lives not knowing what was going on with them, not knowing why they struggled so much with so many things. If they'd had that answer, that would have, I think, made a huge difference to their lives. And kids, you know, if kids are, are old enough to know that somebody is different or that they're different, they're old enough to know the reason why. Um, it's, you know, I went through a, a complicated relationship with the diagnosis. I, at first, like I said, I didn't really understand it. Then I hated it. I tried to distance myself from it. I said, no, this isn't me. Um, and people would say to me, oh, I, I wouldn't know you were on the spectrum until you told me. 
And so I would convince myself that I had to be able to do certain things. And then when I would have difficulties, I would get very frustrated and angry at myself. And then finally, I came to view, view it as an asset instead of a liability. I came to, I was in a film called Normal People Scare Me. It's a documentary um, that came out in 2005. Great film, it has over 65 people on the spectrum and it was directed by a young man with high functioning autism. That was the first time anybody wanted to put my face and voice out on that kind of a scale. And, and that was the first time I realized that my voice could help people. Um, but it's so important to, you know, share that information. If they, you, you, you can do it in an age appropriate way, you know, you can start, you don't have to go into specific technical terminology, but if they're asking, give an answer. Um, and there's a lot more books out now. I think there's one called All Cats Have Asperger's or something like that, All Cats Have Autism. Like, <laughs> that's, I, I think that's probably a good one for kids, I guess. I, I mean, again, I work more with um, older adolescents and adults because there are so few services. So I don't really do the early intervention stuff. I didn't even like kids when I was a kid. But that, so yeah, definitely, definitely give, give the answer in an age appropriate way. Thank you. Uh, we have one up here. Thank you. I wanted to piggyback off her question. What are your suggestions for parents that are not willing to get their child evaluated when you see clear symptoms or signs and the parents are just not there yet? Oh, I don't have the patience for a lot of that malarkey um, <laughs> because you're wasting valuable time there. You're, you're indulging your denial and your kid is not getting the help they need. Like, get over yourself. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be harsh. I know it's a difficult thing for parents, but what, what helps, I think, is actually hearing the accounts from a lot of autistic adults because it helps people see that there is a future. The reason I think people shun or hide a lot from the autism diagnosis is they think that it means the world is over. It's not over. It's absolutely, the story doesn't end there. The story's only beginning there. So if you show people examples of, you know, this is a future that can, you know, this is what people have, who have this, disability or who are autistic have gone on to do, they'll know that it's not the end of the line. Um, sometimes that can help ease some fears, but I really, it, it's hard for me because I'm a very straightforward person. I, I, I just don't feel right in indulging somebody's denial and, and, you know, because I'm just thinking about the kid because that's where my heart is. So just, yeah, and just really encouraging them to look at this not as something horrible, but just as something that is a facet of, of who they're, you know, that, is they need to understand so they can help their child yeah. succeed and thrive. So, thank you. Thank you, Amy. We're gonna have some time, um, we need to take a break now, but we will have time to chat with Amy uh, during the breaks yes. um, as well as in the afternoon. So okay. join me in thanking Amy. That was really a very great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Amy.